It's now my pleasure to welcome on stage uh, the leaders of the Net Gain Challenge, along with uh, Dr. Alondra Nelson. Um, Dr. Nelson is uh, president of the Social Science Research Council and professor of sociology at Columbia University. Um, her work uh, bridges and operates at the intersection of technology, science, inequality, and race. Um, so uh, with that, I would like to welcome them now on stage. Good evening, everyone. I'm so glad to, to delighted to be here. Eric, thank you for that introduction. Um, delighted to be here this evening with this distinguished group of philanthropic leaders who um, are also pioneering in their commitment to helping us think as communities about emergent technology. So um, here with us this evening are Darren Walker, uh, president of the Ford Foundation, Patrick Gaspard, president of Open Societies Foundation, Julia Stash, president of the MacArthur Foundation, and Mitchell Baker, chairwoman and founder of Mozilla. So as you will have heard from uh, comments earlier this evening, um, several of us in the room spent the better part of today um, trying to think together about the social implications of uh, art uh, artificial intelligence through the lens of the arts and of creative expression. And one of my takeaways, I guess, that I was left with, and I wanted to start by um, um, hearing what you uh, made of the day and the conversation, and of course, the, the incredible uh, provoc provocative um, words and ideas we heard in images this evening was the sort of um, the toggle between um uh, being caught in a gilded cage. I mean, if algorithms are sort of rules and, and systems that um, give us directions about how to do things in the world, um, on the one hand, there's a kind of gilded cage, maybe a bit of a beauty to it. And on the other hand, we might just be facing sort of simply prisons, right? That there's, that, but either way, on either side, there's a kind of constraining force. Um, on the one hand, there is incredible um, art op offers for us as, the, as a way to think about um, emergent technologies, um, incredible hope, um, and new narratives. Um, but on the other hand, uh, as uh, Trevor Paglin reminded us this evening, um, some of these systems are, in his words, um, irredeemably undemocratic, right? And so there's this kind of um, very much Janice-based or um, a sort of bittersweet um, uh, moment that we're living in with regards to AI. Um, and so I wanted to, to uh, begin with you, Darren, and sort of get your thoughts on, on how you thought about our conversations today and this evening. Thank you. I'm really delighted to be here. And so algorithms and AI is not new. It is an updated way of control. We've always had control in society. We have now simply in this digital age created a new way of control, a new way of defining power. And what I worry about is that we are simply through AI potentially going to simply replicate all of the uh, discrimination, bias, prejudice, and power <coughs> imbalance that we see in the analog world now in the digital world. And so as the leader of a social justice foundation, what I am concerned about uh, is uh, power and justice. And how does that, how will it be advanced or constrained by technology? And, and so for me, I think we have a responsibility to raise for the public through investments in what I call the three I's, in ideas, in institutions, in individuals, which is what we basically do. We foundations are basically financiers of many of the organizations and the people who we've heard from today. And that's our job. And, and so for me, our responsibility now is to ensure that we are resourcing the people who need to be engaging the public on these questions of justice, that we are investing in a new generation of institutions that currently 
that, that haven't existed mm -hmm. um, and that we are fortifying them to exist for into the future and that we're investing in ideas. Um, many of those ideas may or may not have long-term currency, but they will help to frame how the public understands this question of technology and justice. So that's how I see this. Great, thanks. Patrick? Wait, I don't get a different question? I have to no. no. <laughs> Dar Darren just nailed it. I know, so, it's, it's well, hard to follow. We can't disagree it's Im with Darren. It's but. impossible to, fo to, to follow Darren, but it's even more impossible to follow Lauren. That was a, that was a remarkable uh, presentation, and it really reminds me of something that the science fiction writer William Gibson said, uh, Lauren, when he said that Earth is the alien planet now. And I really think that your presentation and the work of artists like you who are examining and interrogating what uh, uh, AI means uh, in our lives really allows us to pause, to hit the freeze frame button uh, in order to begin to question things that have gone unquestioned for far too long. Mm -hmm. When Kate was making her presentation, she talked about uh, phrenology, uh, and I have to tell you, that as a black man in America, I feel as if I'm phrenologized in every single room I've ever walked into all of my life. But to pick up the thread of, of where Darren started, I think that now I'm phrenologized in a way that's completely unaccountable because it's not uh, done in a way that we have any transparent uh, read into, which is why this conference is so critically uh, important. Uh, this is an urgent matter. Uh, uh, you know, this is, this is something that's real and happening in our lives now. It, it, the, the future isn't stupid. The present is what's actually really insanely stupid. I'll lift up a, a quick uh, anecdote and example from uh, in the realm of public policy in Indiana a few short years ago when uh, the state of Indiana made a decision around 2008, 2009 to figure out ways to streamline their welfare delivery system. Uh, and the governor of Indiana was harping on one instance where two uh, co-workers uh, in uh, their system found a way to game things and steal $8,000 from the system. And so, of course, this meant that everything was broken. So over time, uh, in Indiana, the legislature replaced 1,500 live human beings that were administering uh, welfare benefits, and replaced them with online uh, tools, uh, applications, and a call center. And over the next three years after that, there were one million more denials of benefits uh, in, in those three years. And that was a 54% increase from the three years prior. So people who uh, have been on the margins, desperately poor, who look like uh, my family, uh, were being uh, denied life-saving essential benefits because of the way that these algorithms have become profoundly uh, unaccountable. The, uh, the EU uh, commissioner for competition, Verstager, uh, said not too long ago that algorithms really need to be taken to law school, right? Because uh, this is really not uh, machine learning, it's machine teaching. Uh, and we are t basically teaching these machines to make the same screwed up dumb decisions that human beings have been making for some, for some time now. So this confluence of uh, data science uh, and uh, uh, provocative art uh, is exciting to be able to make an investment in right now. That's great. So we'll go to Julia, but I wanted to ask um, that Right, the, you, you provide a really powerful um, example um, of the um, of the sort of damage that algorithms can do to people's lives. Um, and I wanted, to, I would then ask you to, to sort of what either can the arts or philanthropy do in that space, right? What, what's to be done about this Indiana example? Well, well example? I, I'd say this about philanthropy. And I, I think that the artists who've already been on stage have, have uh, spoken with their uh, example about the power of their intervention. Uh, philanthropy is uh, not as nimble and as inventive uh, as artists are, but there is something that we can do. Mm -hmm. uh, the, uh, the companies that uh, are uh, producing these algorithms, that are benefiting these, from these algorithms, have a tremendous amount of power in the resources that they have and the access that they have to policymakers. Uh, and the work of uh, philanthropy foundations like ours, with our modest investments, can tip the scales a bit uh, in some of uh, the resources, the access, and we can help lift up voices that have been marginalized in these kinds of debates. We know that it's mostly 
uh, people who are well off, who are wealthy, who have the most access to technology, but it's the poorest people in society who are most implicated by uh, the outcomes uh, and being able to uh, lift up those voices uh, in uh, public policy debates is critical in our uh, advocacy. At the end of the day, as Darren said, as Kate said earlier, uh, this is uh, ultimately uh, and truly about power, uh, and foundations can lift up the power of networks. There are examples in the U.S., in the EU, in Sub-Saharan Africa that we can pull together, cobble together uh, to push back against some of the worst abuses from uh, these industries. Thank you. So, Julia, in our conversation earlier today, you um, uh, brought up uh, Mimi Onuhoa's uh, phrase, algorithmic violence, as a way of sort of thinking about what might be some of the more pernicious implications of artificial intelligence. Um, and you also talked a bit about how the work that some of the investments that you're making at MacArthur in the arts um, might be a sort of counterpoint to that. I wondered if you wanted to share some of that with this larger group. So I'll do that in just a moment, sure. but let me pick up a little bit on the notion of urgency. I'm, I have a hard time sort of reconciling uh, the sort of tensions between the sort of increasing uncritical acceptance of uh, systems and practices and, the, and that juxtaposed to what feels like warp speed adoption of, uh, of technologies and algorithms. And so I'm wondering, and this is not what you can say when you're a foundation president because you have to be optimistic at all times. <laughs> but I'm wondering if, if we have enough time, yeah. if we actually have enough time to have the voices at the table that need to be there, if we have enough time to spark the interest of and plumb the, uh, you know, the insights from ethicists, if we actually have enough time to have an impact on the systems that are becoming so pervasive and embedded in our lives. Mm -hmm. And so I think that foundations need to do what you're saying, which is make sure that the only voices aren't the voice, you know, the normative tech uh, male, white male voices. But what I'm saying is that plus the fact that none of us read the terms of service mm -hmm. And we just go, I accept. Mm -hmm. And so are even we who are savvy and understanding, mm -hmm. are we complicating this by our own uncritical acceptance of the changes? And so I'm worried about, I'm worried about running out of time. But I did raise this issue of, I think that we are, and I guess it's part of the same thing. Yeah. I don't think we're thinking urgently enough about the, uh, you know, the embedded flaws in the systems. I mean, we, we talk, you know, almost, you know, sort of flatly about, oh, yes, there's bias and, oh, yes, there's, there are errors being built in. And so we, we say, oh, yes, uh, you know, people aren't getting mortgages or, you know, all the kinds of consequences that play out in, you know, in their daily lives. But this doesn't feel like just a bad thing. It feels like a violent thing. And that's why I was so taken by that phrase, mm -hmm. algorithmic violence. And so when there's violence, it seems to me that it requires a different response than the, measure, uh, the measured research response or the, you know, or the, yes, let's see if we can negotiate with the good guys on the, in the inside of the corporate giants. It says, do we have strong enough advocacy demanding sort of accountability? Funny thing was, I was on a panel with Darren you know, maybe two or three years ago. And I think he said something about, we have to hold these algorithms accountable. And I thought, what? I don't even understand that. Uh, you know, didn't people design them? And that was before I understood that people have a role, but then it's out of our hands in many ways. So I'm worried that the genie is a little bit too much out of the bottle. Can I? Please, can Mitchell. Maybe? Yes. Um, I th the question of whether we're out of time I think we have to look at a long time frame. I think the answer is we are out of time for some generation of people right now. Like that violence is occurring now mm -hmm. um, and, and more is likely to occur. Uh, and so, and the question of are we out of time to stop it before it happens because we were prescient enough to know what's coming. I think that's true. And so there is not only the work of understanding, there's the work of building better, well, building more representative development systems, understanding what's happening, building institutions, getting rid of the 
systems that we have today that are so biased one by one, right? Like that, that's a path. So, so I, I don't mean to be even more critical, but yeah. like th this stuff is happening now. So we won't stop it before it's in our lives. And some portion of us, many more than others, are gonna experience it. So I think the urgency is real, but that shouldn't stop us. Like there's, you know, there's the person born today and the person born tomorrow and the person who's gonna be di denied next week and six months from now and a year from now. And so we have to, we have to make changes for the future. So I'm yes, uh, like, we, like it's on us right now and that should add to the urgency of, of building and there'll be incremental fixes for a while. Here's a system and some, someone has actually figured out exactly how biased it is and then we figure out the right pressure point in the political and power system to somehow try and get it fixed. Mm -hmm. And you know, so very incremental right now that, that needs to build into something that's more sustainable and more ubiquitous. Can I just right. on this but, point please, say, sir. you know, when I hear things and, and like, we're at, are we out of t time? I mean, as a society, we have been out of time for a lot of people when it comes to justice. We were out of time 20 years ago on the war on drugs when we were saying what the implications were going to be for black and brown men in this country. We were out of time then. And so today we're asking once again, are we out of time? And the question is, the answer is no, we're not out of time. We lack the will. And so, Julie, the reason, one of the many reasons I admire you and what you're doing at MacArthur is, you didn't even know what I was talking about two years ago. True. And, and you had no clue. But unlike most of us in foundation land, particularly big foundation land, you got on it because you understood on some level that for, for MacArthur's mission, these issues were important. And you got smart people on your staff like Eric and other people. You got your board on board and you made a big commitment. Unfortunately, we in philanthropy often aren't able to respond with urgency because we are like every other privileged institution in our society. We have the privilege of moving at our own pace. Mm. And, and so if we are to internalize these questions around power and privilege, which implicates us, then we will work with more urgency on these issues. Because the reality is that for the privileged and the powerful, the outcomes, the implications for this conversation are not as dire as they always are. They're never as dire in our society as they are for those who are vulnerable and those who have historically, in our analog world, been left behind. And so the question is, how urgently are we working to ensure that in the digital world they're not left behind? And fortunately, artists who always, always are the ones who can save our society and who have always been the ones, when there's ever been a moment of social inflection, to call America out and to call the powerful and privileged out. Because the artists, artists hold the mirror up and demand of us that we interrogate who we say we are with who we actually are. And they're doing that through this work, this intersection of art and technology today. And so that's why for those of us who are investing, and there are not enough of us in philanthropy, we've got to figure out a way to broaden. Because if it's the same five foundations in that game that it was five years ago, five years from now, um, that urgency is not going to be met. So I want to push on this point a little bit, but, um, but for, for all of you, about how you connect the dots, right? So Lauren, Heather, um, you know, Dorothy showed us incredible works that sort of, for a moment, I think all of us were enwrapped and we were literally taken somewhere else. We were taken to different worlds, right? And so how do you take the power of that transformation and make it into social change? Like what, like what is the role of the philanthropy in sort of connecting the dots in that transformation? 
I don't want to be the only one to talk. I've got yeah. a lot of them. <laughs> <laughs> well, that my well, brilliant well colleague. I'll speak from our perspective because. Yeah. Um, and that perspective is trying to bridge philanthropy, technology, and, and product and consumer market, which is very complex you know, at that moment. But, but part of what connects the dots is the imagination and the ability to see something else. And so we, we see this in technology, too, and in building technology, is that the, right now, you know, everything is convenient. Like this is the problem with mass surveillance. Alexa is convenient. This, our phones are convenient. You know, we surveil ourselves, uh, uh, and we surveil ourselves in our own homes now. So, so convenience is is like people just sort of expect it and are resigned and have given up. Like there is really no choice. Uh, and even if I opt out of Facebook, and you know, like the rest of the world is still surveilling me. So, so part of it is that you have the reflection and you have the idea, like that the. the that we experienced earlier tonight, and you can see a possibility. And humans are much better when they see and have internalized that something different and better is possible. Mm -hmm. And so we see that even in technologists, you know, you know, there's, there's, a, there's a, there is a, a, you know, I am, I do love technology. So you know, the, the, there is something about calling out in technologists as well the possibility of something different, mm -hmm. um, and, and something like even as basic as a browser. Before we built it, everybody knew we were stupid. Like, you know, it was an IE world, and it was a Windows world, and, you know, we were just stupid. But, but if you can take a possibility and make it real so people can see it, then behavior changes. And so I connect the dots by thinking that the prototyping and the, 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 the different worlds that we're into shows a possibility of what is and what could be different. And if you can, like a prototype, and if you can even get to a prototype of something that's different with your relationship to technology, then, you know, the possibilities multiply. So I was just thinking about the role of artists and the sort of translational dynamic that, uh, that an artist can uh, can create. I mean, we can fund research, and we can, uh, you know, and we can mount an information campaign about something to raise the awareness. But there's something about the, you know, the sort of creative moment of interaction between an an artist's work or an artist's performance and the people that experience that. Then they see it in a way that is meaningful to them. And so it seems to me that if we could actually acknowledge the role to a greater degree of different translators than we typically think of, if we were to actually say, we want every single young person to experience uh, you know, uh, the perils or the concerns or the things uh, related to technology, along with the opportunities of it, are we not acknowledging that there are different ways for those people to learn and that one of the ones that we want to pay a lot of attention to is the one that gives them the immediate sense of understanding? Because then I think that if there's sort of a popular uprising of sort of, of understanding or demand for accountability, that's an essential complement to a future that looks different. Mm -hmm. And we have this to... Is, the, the, go go I, I, I rarely cut off my big brother. I'm, I'm wary of that. But I, so, you know, I think um, to, to go to, back to the premise of your question, I, I just want to be really clear in noting that philanthropy, foundations uh, don't create social movements. Uh, what we can do, though, uh, is help socialize the right set of questions that can inform uh, movements and, and, and lift up a, a set of actors who can then uh, make transformational uh, change. Uh, the people who are um, uh, pushing uh, this technology uh, into our lives are really driven by an efficiency uh, paradigm, right? It's an efficiency paradigm. They're trying to figure out ways to make uh, uh, many decisions as quickly uh, as possible. But an efficiency paradigm isn't necessarily the best thing for things like, you know, social welfare and justice, because due process is a complicated thing, right? So in order to push back against that efficiency paradigm, we can help 
ask the right kinds of questions about how this technology uh, is applied. For instance, uh, in 2014, uh, which now seems like a million years ago, there was an attorney general named uh, Eric Holder, who actually had read the Constitution. Uh, and, <laughs> And he uh, released a study that uh, demonstrated that uh, uh, algorithm uh, risk assessment tools that were being used already uh, in courts were profoundly flawed uh, and started asking a number of questions that then those of us in foundations picked up and disseminated uh, and connected to the work of activists, grassroots activists on the ground, uh, to artists, to other data scientists, and helped really uh, convene uh, conversations uh, that, uh, that spurred uh, action and the right questions being asked uh, in uh, the halls of Congress. Fast forward now to 2018, brand new world, brave new universe, uh, and we see the quick, quick, rapid adaptation uh, of that technology in ways that's really distorting uh, outcomes uh, in uh, bail decisions. Uh, and, and, and we're doing this with technology that a recent study demonstrated that a, a random person picked off the street who's paid a, a, a dollar uh, could make uh, decisions that are much more accurate about predicting who's more likely to be a recidivist uh, or not. So this is a dangerous time dangerous set of tools uh, being controlled by unaccountable and poorly informed and deeply biased actors. So in philanthropy, appreciating this, knowing something of uh, the history, knowing that everything uh, old uh, is new again, uh, that can just kind of drive a set of strategic decisions uh, and uh, investments that create linkages and networks that can help, help uh, to motivate uh, a, a pushback. But we can't be the primary progenitors uh, of that. Just yeah. want to be careful about how, we, how we frame that. Yeah. Yeah. Well, Darren, you were going to... No, I, I would just say <laughs> that, you know, when I think about the things that we lack as a society today, the thing that we lack most is empathy. Mm -hmm. Basic, fundamental empathy as a society. Technology does nothing <clears throat> to contribute to our producing a more empathetic society and for us to be a more empathetic people. And at the end of the day, in order to have justice, a society must have empathy. And so we as philanthropy should be doing all we can to support those inputs that make us more empathetic, which is so much about the arts yes. yeah. and so much about artists mm -hmm. and art making mm -hmm. and arts institutions. And so why aren't we investing more and artists, arts institutions, art making. So I think we need to think about that more. And then within our own institutions, at the end of the day, our priorities, I mean, no matter what any big foundation says on their website, <laughs> get the document that's not on our website, which is our annual budget and what we prioritize mm -hmm. in terms of grant making. And and that will tell you what our priorities are. And so the reality is that we aren't allocating enough resources within our own budgets because it means that we have trade-offs, that we are saying that this is more important. I know this from my own experience in my own institution, which had a very modest investment in this space. And thanks to the good leadership of Jenny Toomey and educating me because I was like you. I had no idea what net neutrality was until <laughs> I met Jenny. But even though I was a Luddite, I understood on some level that the implications for justice, once I really came to, to know the implications of, of, of all of this, this technology. So you have to, within your own organization, say, OK, we may have to spend less on blank because this is more important. And we have to have a conviction about that. I'm asked all the time, why do you spend more money at the Ford Foundation on the arts and humanities than you do on jobs? That's a legitimate question, mm -hmm. because jobs are really, really critical. Mm -hmm. One of the reasons is because more foundations actually think like that. And so I'm actually more interested in helping people experience beauty. Beauty. Yes. 
because everybody deserves. <laughs> and so, as a matter of as a matter of of grant making, um, being comfortable uh, with the conviction that the arts matter in a democracy, and that without beauty, people can't be sustained. And without creativity and free expression, a democracy will die. And so as a foundation with an objective of promoting democracy and advancing democratic principles, the arts matter a whole lot. Um, and so for me, it's not that what we do at Ford is the right way. It's not that, and I say this with all humility, but I also, coming back to where Julie, I think, rightly positioned the conversation around urgency, um, the urgency demands of us that we get out of our traditional boxes and that we upend our normative behavior that simply reinforces the status quo. The status quo is not going to get us out of this hole. So it's such a, a profound point around empathy because you know the examples of predictive policing, the examples of um, the sort of routinization of social services are examples also of an abstraction away from human connection, right? Again and again, and so uh, you know the sort of algorithmic society that's building up around us actually makes this actually more urgent and more acute, and, and ways that are, are worth thinking about. So I've been told we've got to wrap up. So one last sort of musing for um, the four of you would be around the future. So we're re refiguring the future this evening. We've been refreshing the future this evening. We've been talking about the future this afternoon. Uh, what is the, the sort of future role for philanthropy? We know it has to be around these issues. It has to be more urgent. It has to be thinking outside of the box. Um, it has to be more nimble. Um, what, what would you offer as, 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 as the future of, uh, as a, of a, for a, a philanthropic world that is going to sort of help us engage uh, this important issue? So I've got a couple of things to offer, and one is smallish, and the other is maybe a little bit bigger. But the first is that if we're going to, you know, uh, if we're going to say others need to be working with our support or not on a better world, we need to say, how are we modeling that? We need to be authentic in our own practices. And so in this arena of technology, in this moment of, uh, you know, of uh, the need to actually demonstrate to others, even in a small <coughs> universe like philanthropy, but one of the things that the Ford Foundation just did was they published on their website all of the data that the Ford Foundation collects in plain English, in bullet point list, so that I know that if I sign up for a newsletter, you've got who I am, where I live, and if I filled out a little bit of a something, you know, you know, I'm a, I'm a woman, I'm a, you know, whatever else I am. But the point is that we now know how you collect data and also what you do with it. And so that's the simple sort of thing that if others, if we could sort of say, okay, I'm gonna do that, you should do that, and then we could sort, start to demand that of others. So a little bit of modeling, I think, mm -hmm. could make our engagement in this whole arena more authentic. So well, let me stop there, just let others envision the future. That's a tiny little piece. It's a wonderful one. It's hard to engage in the future here because uh, Lawrence has terrified me of the future. Yes, exactly. <laughs> I feel, it feels like Shelley's monster has completely <laughs> run amok here, uh, and, and I'm not quite sure how we uh, regain control. But and, and I, you know, and I'm someone who uh, is already a bit of a uh, luddite who fears these things. But I, I, you know, I'll, I'll say this: I think it's important uh, for philanthropy for all of us uh, to actually consistently lift up examples of. Uh, things that um, uh, actually do work uh, in, in spaces where uh, there's an instinct towards uh, uh, resistance to lift up a little bit of prescription. So since we're in Chicago, despite the fact that I am terrified of uh, the explosive use of algorithms, I'll point out an example of uh, algorithm, algorithmic uh, uh, public policy that I think is useful and hopeful. Here in Chicago, they have a system called Embrylief, where you can go on a government website, put uh, information about yourself, uh, and it tells you by reading a set of algorithms what uh, benefits you might be eligible for, and then it connects you to a, 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 a flesh and blood human being uh, who's able to uh, actually uh, walk you 
uh, through a set of protocols to actually access those benefits. So being able to uh, marry uh, technology uh, with uh, some old school uh, social service uh, delivery, uh, I think is a positive prescription here in Chicago that could get modeled and replicated elsewhere. So being able to point up uh, things that are working even in spaces uh, that uh, cause us uh, some trepidation is I think an important role uh, that philanthropy uh, has to play. Um, I'm trying to believe that uh, truth crushed to earth will rise again through Wi-Fi, so I'm gonna hold on to that sense of, of optimism <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> so Mitchell, I, I can't help but ask you about the Mozilla Manifesto, which is a, you know, is a document or a message that talks about what the future should be like. Um, it really responds to the question that Kate posed to us about what is the world we want to create. Would you, yeah. Do you want to say something yes, about that? Yes, that'd be great. First, I, I was also going to add on the what should philanthropy do, uh, a familiarity with technology is really important. Same with artists. Like, like the ability, like we saw today, to have artists who have facility with technology and aren't afraid of it and can do tech, like that is a like that is new in the last few years and amazingly powerful. And so if and as philanthrop ah, sorry, philanthropy is comfortable in using tech, I think that will also be important. Uh, we as as builders of technology at, at Mozilla are also trying to represent public asset, public benefit of, of the network and how we can build it and what we you can imagine and think of and demand of ourselves and commit to ourselves as we build technology. And so we've, all, we've had a manifesto for uh, a decade or so. Uh, uh, and, and recently in the last uh, month or two, we have added to it to express more clearly what the human experience might be. So to actually, and this may seem obvious, coming out of philanthropy or social justice or you know, uh, the world of art, but, but for technologists, it's, it, it's actually a big deal um, to say that you know, we actually think that like civil discourse and human dignity, that the internet and the technology we build should have as a goal a human experience of, of decency, you know, rational thought and civil discourse, as well as inclusion. So, so this is, it's new. I mean, it, it's been, uh, it took me a while. I mean, I spent a long time on it uh, to make sure that the Mozillians, like the global movement that is Mozilla, feel like this is us. And so now I, I hope to start connecting with other organizations and see, you know, what are the tools that could draw us together as a louder and more effective voice that technology, when it's built, should be uh, both inclusive but also aiming at the human experience, not just the efficiency argument. Brilliant. Thank you. Um, should we give the last word to the inimitable Darren Walker? Is there anything uh, more you want to? No. Say? I mean, I think when you talk about philanthropy, you know. Dr. King said something in 1968 to a group of philanthropists. He said that philanthropy is commendable, but it should not allow the philanthropist to, the, to ignore the very injustice that makes philanthropy necessary. Yes. <laughs> and what he, what he was saying to us is that at the core of philanthropy ought not to be charity, but justice. <laughs> and if justice is at the core of your philanthropy, it will demand of you to do some things that will make you uncomfortable because you are, Im you are implicated in your philanthropy. And injustice is also implicated. And so I think that as we think about the future, mm -hmm. I actually, while I too, like my brother Patrick, am terrified by some of the things that I see, I actually don't see a dystopian future. I think we have the capacity to have a better outcome this time. And the question just is, do we have the will? And I'm encouraged. I'm encouraged in philanthropy because I see more foundations coming to the table, more of us recognizing that even in our own shops, we are woefully uh, capacitated to take this on and therefore looking for means, uh, as we've done at Ford, by hiring tech fellows, 
um, having a new complement of staff, but that has required us to get out of our normative mm -hmm. patterns uh, of hiring and talent recruitment and, and all of that, right? So if we're willing to get a, a little uncomfortable and outside of uh, our uh, traditional behaviors, um, I actually don't see a dystopian future at all. I'm very optimistic. So Patrick wants to get in where the acceleration we've been talking about is happening to us on this stage, but please, um, <laughs> please. Well, da Darren's bringing Dr. King into this, and uh, Dr. King always said that uh, dissent and dissatisfaction has to be creative dissent and creative dissatisfaction. So I just want to note that in order to bring the artists back yes. as the exclamation point in this conversation, and I hope that their creative dissent and their creative dissatisfaction will be disruptive for those of us who are on stage as well, and that you'll uh, question the sorts of commitments and investments that we make uh, in this space. So it's just, just been absolutely incredible. Thank you. Yeah. So just a final word, and I think that is, <laughs> I think that we ought to challenge ourselves to say, is there anything that we're working on that could not benefit from greater engagement with artists? And with technology, I think, taking Mitch's point. Yes. Yeah. But I meant beyond that, if we're yeah. talking about climate or nuclear risk yeah. or yeah. journalism or anything, do we have the sufficient <laughs> intellect, challenge, provocation, do we have enough of that to make sure that our choices are better informed? It's a wonderful way to end. Thank you for the vision that is the Net Gain Partnership, and thank you for the